Welcome everyone to Engineering Conversations. As always, we have another inspiring engineer on the show today. She's a mechanical and manufacturing engineer um, who focuses on quality management and continuous improvement. She's also chart a chartered quality professional from the Chartered Quality Institute um, a Lean Six Sigma belt, Black Belt and a member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology. She currently works in one of the universities up at Scotland. Um, she's a researcher as well. She's won a numerous number of um, grants from the Global Challenges Research Fund, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Scottish Funding Council, <laughs> and Ingenious Award for Public Engagement. Everyone, welcome Dr. Evie to Engineering Conversations. Thank you, Sophia. And, you know, welcome to everybody that will be listening to this interview. Uh, I have to say, you know, I never thought myself as an inspiring engineer, but thank you for that. <laughs> Evie, you are inspiring. We don't see too many um, engineers, female engineers in academia, and you are one of the few. So you do inspire us. And that is why today we have you on the show. So for a quick, I have four quick fire questions for you. And then we'll, what was the last book that you read? Non-academic. No, 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 not academic. Uh, the last book, I'm still reading it actually. I haven't finished it. Is 23 things that you don't know about capitalism. Oh, <laughs> so okay. Not engineering, yes. <laughs> is it, um, what type of book is it? Uh, it's about, it's from Economist. Uh, oh. I'm very interested in like, uh, you know, something that's relevant to your faith, you know, how uh, it's not all about making money. It's about looking after the environment, the people. So okay. although, you know, everybody in mostly the Western world is like, you want to make money, that's a, a indication of growth and things going well. It's not. <laughs> there are more things in life than money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have to check the book out. Um, what are some of the misconceptions or myths people have told you about engineering that shocked you? What I heard, and it wasn't that long ago, it was a couple of years ago when I was in London, and I got into a taxi and the taxi driver was asking me, where did you go? I said, I'll go on our London campus. Um, UWS has a campus in London. I said, I teach engineering. And he was like, oh, you don't look like an engineer. And he was like, how do engineers look? It's like, do I have to carry a tool belt and you know where Dungar is? Do I have to have smeared with like engine oil? So it was like, it was this one. And the conception that, you know, an engineer, in most books and throughout history are white male men so that's not how it is <laughs> and there we go um, <laughs> which would you choose quality of life or quantity of life quality you know it's not because it's my field it's like it's not about how long we live it's you know how we live that's what i think <clears throat> okay would you prefer the sunny beaches or cold snowy weather this is a trick question for you though it is a trick question you know i'm greek and i live in scotland so i got both of them you know throughout my life i got the sunny beaches and you know the, the cold weather <clears throat> and i think having one of both all the time it would be boring that's you know that's a fact uh, because i appreciate more the greek weather when i'm in scotland and when I go back in Greece and it's like heat wave in the middle of the summer, summer I miss like the the coolness of the Scottish summers. So I think it's not about the weather, it's about the company you have and the mood you have. But I have to say, because, you know, we're in lockdown, uh, it's raining um, all day. And there is a saying like in, in Scotland, there are only two seasons, like June and winter. And, you know, we feel that. Uh, I would say sunny, bit sunny, sunny bits is now. <laughs> so we'll get into today's interview. Um, so, what inspired you into engineering? How did your journey into engineering begin? You know, 
your questions because people I had them before and I'm still unprepared. I thought I'll have time to give some, you know, well thought wise answers. It's not going to happen. And they made me think. <laughs> and it wasn't like I didn't grow up and say, I want to become an engineer. I wasn't playing with Lego bricks and my family wasn't financial very well off. So it was a level of deprivation in my life, which I didn't know as a kid. You know, it's when you think back and think, oh, we were rather poor. But as a kid, you're happy. Um, but I think it was inspiration from my brother, my, my father and my mother. Um, although research says most of the female engineers, they inspired from, their, from a man in their life. I think my mom had a, you know, a catalytic role. Um, because I couldn't afford the latest toys, my dad used to modify wooden fruit boxes and make them into those houses. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, you know, you can take you can take something and you repurpose it. Or if you don't have it, you can make something. You know, if you have the skills. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember my brother had such a curious uh, mind. He used to take like all radios, uh, and he would, you know turn them inside out so he will empty the on the components and then he will put them back together so all the chip and things it will be like art it will be like scary kind of art at the time so it's because you know this curiosity like you can you know how the computer works you know why we press this button what does it make it you know turn the kettle on or you know something else <clears throat> And then my mom gave me, you know, she never said, that's not for you, you know, uh, it's not for something else than you go and become hairdresser. Mm -hmm. She so just let me make my own choices. So my family and my upbringing uh, was something that, um, you know, pushed me over there or nudged me over there. It wasn't, you know, I said I didn't inspire, I wasn't like drawing buildings and I say, I'll go to construction engineering. It just happened. And at the beginning, I wasn't even sure that I would be good at that. Um, you know, I'm a mechanical manufacturing engineer, but I didn't have the drive that said my brother would have to tinker with engines and things. <clears throat> but I was good, uh, you know, with maths. Um, I could understand certain concepts. Engineering is essential about common sense with a little bit of knowledge to back this up. Um, and what I usually say to you know, some of the groups uh, that I've worked with, I work with some family groups, we've done a lot of um, STEM engagement activities, um, especially with families, not just with kids, because you cannot have the, the one without the other. And I will explain uh, later, you know, how my thinking works. It's like, we're all engineers, that's how sometimes we don't even realize it. So if anyone wants their mom or they, they made a cake, you know, think about the different components that are there. You measure things, yes? You've got metrology. You put things in in a certain order. That's operations management. And then you mix them all together. You put them in the oven and you've got like liquids and solids and then become, you know, something yummy. That's chemical engineering kind of, yes? Yep. So we do have engineering, you know, the moment that my daughter like puts lipstick or, you know, uh, in my age, I start dyeing my hair. You know, these kind of things, you know, I do it without my hair turning green. You know, it's it's engineering many of the things. If a table is wobbly and you put a bit of paper or a book under there, there is a problem and you try and sort it. So people sometimes underestimate the skills that they have. I said, everybody's engineer. <laughs> I like your definition of an engineer and engineering is common sense with a bit of knowledge but like you said with the examples most people are doing little things around in their homes cooking dyeing your hair the makeup that women we like to wear and it all has bits of engineering in there but we don't know and we don't even appreciate it as well absolutely yes it's it said the one example like I give, I cannot ride a bike, you know, I never had a bike, I couldn't, you couldn't afford it, but everywhere, every kid that, you know, got on a bike, it's like, you don't realize it, but it's physics, yes, it's like, you push your foot backwards and you go forwards, 
and I'm sure that you will be able to explain, you know, is it the third law of physics? Keep me right, Sophia. It's like action and reaction. Yes. You know? You're swimming. You go in the bath, you go in, water goes up. That's analysis. You know, it's happening and you're so used about that. We don't even think, why ah, this is happening, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think is is the it also boils down to having a curious mind about the things around us as well, which which your both you and your brother had, but it looked very different. Um, how your brother was just breaking things up, trying to fix them, and you were you took the approach where you would actually sit down, and analyze it, what is happening here. So moving on. Um, you are in academia. Most times when people hear of engineers, academia is not the place most people expect to find engineers, but you are in academia. What research areas are you involved in? Oh, um, what I love about academia is, and what I love about where I am, you know, I can speak for the place I am, the University of Earth in Scotland. Um, it's, first of all, it's the place that I did my master's. So I like the fact that it was a, a small university, relatively small then, it's bigger now. And the, my teachers, my lecturers got to know me as a person. So, you know, they supported me. Uh, and, you know, we, we have relationships that are still going on today. Um, so I like to give something back. I, I enjoy this experience. And it's I work I work in industry. I work in different countries. I work in local authority, believe it or not. And I thought that I like the social aspect of academia. You know, it's like you can do things, you know, in an office, and we can uh, come with ideas, you know, into the process or do something. But this kind of communication and you know the, the fact that you. I, I was hoping I would be able to give back the same experience that my lecturers gave me as a student, something to inspire you and, you know, realize that you've got potential, you know, and I wasn't a confident, you know, postgraduate student. I have to say that it's like international student in the UK and for the ones that come to Scotland, you realize all the English that I learned the previous year and it's like how the Queen sounds, it did not work in Scotland, you know, it's like was a culture shock um, but it's like I I loved the postgraduate experience and I thought that's a place that I want to be part of because you got the chance to teach you know to learn students keep me young you know it's like the curious minds and we can see how they transform from when they join the course till they graduate and the careers that they have and you know and I don't feel I do anything you know like it's all them, but we do not realize it's all them. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like mm -hmm. <clears throat> seeing people see their potential. You know, this is a gift. It's like unplugging something or triggering something that it's in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the research part, you know, we will talk, I think, about my research and it's like, it's fascinating <laughs> for me. <laughs> Very selfish. <laughs> so before we come back to um, the research, um, but what ways do you think we can get more girls to, point, to one, pursue engineering and then two, stay within the engineering, um, stay within engineering for their careers, whether it's in industry or it's in, or it's in academia? For, for girls, <clears throat> because I researched the topic, you know, as part of some of my projects, um, Girls, as a, as a gender, you know, it feels sometimes like we're, we're doing, don't understand our own worth. Um, girls as young as nine years old, they don't feel confident enough to do maths, you know, in STEM. So it's like, we're never confident enough, bright enough, pretty enough, young enough, thin enough, or anything enough. And it's all, you know, within our heads, really. Um, I think we need a little bit of the male testosterone or something and so for me it was i do not want necessary all the girls to become engineer i want them to know they have this option that if you want you can do it nothing can stop you and one of the reasons i work with families was like you know i've got my degrees i'm working as engineer 
sometimes if my kids come and ask me something, I do not know the answer, Sophia. You know, I'm not afraid to say that. And I thought, if I'm not confident on my STEM skills, you know, how many parents out there feel that, you know, they never had an engineering degree. So that was into like doing engagement, you know, with families and make them understand that, you know, you know things, as we said, and we don't even know that you know things. Because if I cannot inspire my own kids, which I hope I do, you know, it's like how, you know, many parents will be in the same uh, position. It's like, I don't know, you know, go on Google mm -hmm. or something like that. But it's about learning together. It's about like, yes, let's find out about that. You know, let's dissect, you know, let's take apart this uh, machine or let's bake something or let's, you know, put some baking soda on a lemon and make a volcano together. It doesn't have to be expensive or complicated. You will know that. <laughs> I really like your answer because I think there is also this perception that when you are in certain careers, you know everything. And I'm going to be the first one to say I don't know everything. I feel like every day I'm, I'm out of uni, I'm out of school, but every day I'm learning. Learning doesn't stop. And I think that is one thing people don't realize. Learning doesn't stop when you're out of school, out of uni. It continues throughout. Um, because the world we also live in is changing so much that you can't afford not to learn as the world as the world we live in is changing. So I think that is key. And even as an engineer, even if you're a doctor, if you were a nurse, I'm you will be learning because like even thinking about the current pandemic, nobody has dealt with none of our um, none of the physicians hospitals nobody had dealt with COVID, but they had to learn and figure out ways to help patients that come in there and that learning won't stop until maybe Absolutely. we die <laughs> until maybe Absolutely. we die but then i think every day is every day is a day that you can choose to learn something new Absolutely. As I said, I'm reading about cap capitalism. You know, I was reading about, I'm very interested in biomimicry because the nature is amazing. You know, it's, we're learning so, there are so many things that we don't know that the nature teaches us because it's so balanced, you know, there is no waste and we have to deal with a lot of waste nowadays. But for young girls, I would say, you know, essentially believe in yourself, whatever people tell you. Because sometimes, you know, they do not always get the support from their immediate background, sometimes even from school. And that's regardless of gender. I had some of my students telling me that when they were at school, some of the teachers told them, you are not university material, you know, don't even try. And it's like, you know what, if nothing else, it will be fascinating to prove them wrong. You know, prove all the people they don't believe in you wrong. You know, it's like whatever you want to do, you can do it. You know, you can at least you owe yourself to give it a try. <laughs> yep, I totally agree with you on that. Engineering in academia and industry, there is this mindset that people who are do who are practicing engineering in industry and people um, engineers in academia don't work together. And as you mentioned earlier on, you are even doing some work for the council and how how do you how do you envisage a marriage between these two areas because people think there is this huge gap between industry academia engineering but they're actually all working together but people don't seem to know absolutely there is this misconception and perhaps it was in the past and I think in the UK you are doing rather well, you know, in relationship to other um, countries. Um, because it's like you cannot, for example, from an academic perspective, a teaching perspective, you cannot teach kids, in my case, kids, <laughs> I call them kids, you cannot teach students, you know, about quality management or project management and teach them skills that the industry doesn't want or need. So you need this dialogue to make sure there are business ready, yes, and business ready, it's not 
always about the technical skills, it's about the soft skills as well. Mm -hmm. So you need to prepare them for the jobs that are out there now and the jobs that will be out there in 10, you know, years or, you know, longer. So that's one thing. And the other is an academia or doing research and, you know, one of the main purposes of research is to make things better. For example, let's say uh, plastic a problem, you know, the plastic waste. It's like companies producing products, they have a lot of waste of or the electronic and electrical waste. Yes, every one of us goes through mobiles and laptops and these have an impact. So it's like if one has the, the practical application and the other has the knowledge, so it is it's a match made in heaven, you know. There are different perspectives. And as I said, in the UK, we're lucky enough because there is funding from the UK a Research and Innovation Council, you know, to promote this cooperation. Because money, money helps. If you are a small company and you're trying just to survive, you know, you don't have to take a step back sometimes and say, let's spend some time researching that thing, or the stuff, or the time, or the skills. So, so it works, it complements each other. And, you know, then in, um, we have the knowledge transfer partnerships as well, which is a very nice way to make this happen. Because the university learns about something, you know, and they, they do the research and they support. And they're not this kind of ivory tower that sometimes people think they, it, you know, they are. We teach and we philosophize, either it's engineering or something else, and you know it's not practical. Especially engineering, you know, it's practical. Oh. It's like how we improve lives. So, so there are ways and it it really makes sense, you know, we said you prepare your students, you know, you as you said earlier, you learn something, you learn the perspective of it's one thing for me to design, you know, a flow in the manufacturing operation, how the, the products will go. I can I can run my simulations, you know, I can test it. But, you know, unless I press this button and the person that works on the front line tells me what happens, I will never have, you know, you know, fully realization what's actually happening. Because what you design and what happens when you implement something can be two totally different things. <laughs> Um, I love your answer about university serving as a knowledge transfer unit that feeds industry with what they need. Um, so the two, the two always work hand in hand. But like you mentioned that earlier on, there's this misconception that there are two separate bodies. And that is how engineering in academia feeds into our local industries around us. Um, there is also lots of information currently now um, and a few campaigns that have been run over the past few years about the number of women in engineering. Um, and then when you also start to look at different engineering departments across the UK, um, when we look at the, the number of females or women in these departments, sometimes it's just one single person, two people, and then in some departments, there is no one else. Um, what do you think has accounted for this and how can we encourage, um, I guess, young engineers um, who are researchers or who have a doctorate to stay in academia? I know you mentioned a bit of this about how your university was welcoming um, earlier on in the interview and how that encouraged you to want to be um, to stay in academia? Yeah, academia can be quite competitive, you know, in certain settings. And I think the people perhaps that we work within academia, they can, uh, they may agree with me. And, um, you know, there are many women with qualifications, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, women take the the load of the caring responsibilities, either that's kids or parents or anything. So it's really challenging, you know, unless you have a working environment that, you know, fosters a flexible work pattern to combine it with many other things. 
and I have to say, you know, as women, we're trying to do everything. We're trying to, you know, to have the house clean. It doesn't happen in my case, you know, to spend time with ourselves, with our partners, with our friends, with our kids. We're trying, we're so strict and demanding of ourselves. And, you know, we want to be very good in our work as well. It's a very tricky balance. But as I said, if you find them, there are ways that I think things are improving. So universities have Athena Shua now to acknowledge, you know, the support. When I came back from my maternity leaves, you know, you feel like, my goodness, you know, I haven't, I have been out of research because as I said, I was in the local authority. I've only been in academia for four years, you know, so I do not have a vast experience. And I was terrified to go back into that because I didn't have a great publication record since my PhD. You know, I didn't know how to use the virtual learning environments. It's a lot. But as I said, I wanted to give something back. And I was able, you know, my working environment really um, helped me. And what we don't realize, as I said, many people do not realize our engineering skills. Women that they get a career break for whatever reason, we don't realize how many things we learn. So anybody that had a young person or a, or a pet and enter a room and they scan the room for tripping hazard, choking hazard, sub corners, you are doing your research, your risk management. You know, it's like no other person knows how to identify risks. And then you just scale it up. Yeah. Time management, <laughs> multitasking, Anybody that managed to successfully negotiate with a three-year-old that has a tantrum and win, you know, it's like, you can teach us. Um, so you pick up a lot of skills, you know, during all these breaks, you know, it's like, and as long as you've got the thirst to, to knowledge and better yourself, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's like you persevere and that's, uh, that's the thing. But yes, as I said, when I joined my when I joined my many universities, I start looking how many female engineers there are, especially on senior roles. There are many out there, so that does have, uh, you know, an impact. Um, my my line manager is uh, the first. It was the first female senior lecturer in the university, and I, I'm proud to say that was like many many years ago. And now she's a head of engineering, and I see that more happening. You know, people notice, you know, the changes. Uh, and you can, you can see change in the making, you know, are part of that. What you are doing, it's part of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is so true. Um, what type of support, whether professional or personal, would you say would make some of, um, would make the life of um, women much more easy and anchor them to stay in their role so you you just spoke about coming back from maternity from your maternity leaves and still having that conducive um being welcomed back basically you didn't feel like okay where am i starting from again what kind of support would you say institutions or companies um should have in place that would get women would feel at ease to come back into the work environment there are there are certain schemes, but for me, a flexible working, you know, it matters a lot. To work around, you know, apart from the teaching, you know, if I have to reply to my emails after seven o'clock, I want to be able to do that. I don't want to have to do it like this specific time. Um, you know, the the fact that you are invited to like conferences and traveling when you used to travel, it's like you know. You have like you have to take care of the kids. You cannot travel. It's to have an inclusive, uh, you know, environment. Uh, to have the respect to be heard. You know, I'm sure many women uh, out there, females, that they were in board meetings, they were dismissed. You hear about untitling. You know, it's like you know keeping this respect within the working environment and being able to be heard and contribute. It's whatever you want to go uh, it's like we want to go somewhere that we feel valued and appreciated and be able to to progress because we don't want to be stagnated and be pigeonholed and it's about seeing our skills so there are as i said um 
development programs. I think Aurora is one of them for leadership, you know, to become a little bit confident, to have the skills. Many universities strive for their finish home, which is, you know, wonderful. They have specific schemes to support women. And, you know, you see more and more organizations showcasing female engineers. One of my collaborators, she's an engineering historian and she's amazing, Dr. Nina Baker. She dedicated, you know, the last, I don't know how many decades of her life, bringing to life all these women engineers that nobody heard about, like the car wipers. It was an engineer, I don't know how many years ago that she came with the idea in New York and somebody, and she went to a car company and it was Ford and they told her, that's a stupid idea. You know, who needs these things to distract them? Can you imagine a car without wipers now? You know, the radar, female engineer and an actress, it's like the dishwasher, the fridge. We don't even know how many things women, uh, you know, developed, invented and, you know, produce out there. You only hear about the white males because sometimes actually they took credit for the work. Wow. <laughs> the first car for women, you know, it's like, it, the, the women that came up with the laundromat service that many of us uses, it's amazing. <laughs> that, um, that really shows, with the examples that you've given of all the excellent work that women are doing in the field, and once we have that supportive environment, workplaces, we will see women giving up their best and con we've already been contributing, but we're going to see more than we are currently seeing. What advice would you give to any female who wants to pursue a career in following your footsteps? You know, I always tell them, the, the girls at school, or actually the young people, it's like, do not have to follow my footsteps, find your own footsteps. Yes, and if that's engineering, that's okay. If it's something else, it's like, as I said earlier, find to do something that, you know, makes you want to get out of bed in the morning. Yes, something that your imagination, something that fuels your drive to do better. Um, because, you know, it's like anything else will be like a soul, it will be like me asking my kids to tie to their own. They will do it, but it will be like, oh, so find something that really, you know, makes you, yes, I want to do that. It will not be like that all the time, but you know, you need to find your, you know, create your own steps. So in a few years time, Sophia will interview you and say, what inspired you into engineering? It's one of the, I think it was um, one of the ancient philosophers. Uh, I think it was Aristotle. He said, do something you love, you know, for life and you don't have to work a day mm -hmm. and you know that exactly that <laughs> and it will be ups and downs but you know it it makes a difference uh, being unhappy at work it has such a knock of effect or doing something that doesn't suit your skills i've done it we all done it at some point you know i cleaned bathrooms i packed supermarket shelves i worked in factories and farms we do it but it's like you keep in mind that's not what I want to do. I want to do that. <laughs> so um, I think it's always having a vision of where you want to go to and working your way through it. We will all have different journeys. There are different, like if we're all going to London, we'll probably use different parts of the motorway, but at the end of the day, we'll get to London. So mm -hmm. the, the path, the pathway will be different, but at the end of the day, if you keep on, you're being resilient, you persevere, you will get there. How important would you say work-life work balance is um, to an engineer or to an acad uh, or someone in academia? I think, you know, if you do this as a survey question in academia, you will say, yeah, that's, that, that's an urban myth, uh, you know. Um, I think it's it's hard when you do something that to love to switch off from it. Um, for example, some of my research and my interests as I mentioned it's like um, about uh, sustainability. It's a lot about work with um, 
women um, in you know in the global south so even when i look for the news when i relax i research about that but it's about finding the time that you kind of empty your mind you know like you switch off a little bit and be able to say not today i will not respond to any emails i will not do anything because you know in engineering terms um especially manufacturing engineer there is a part of continuous improvement that it's called total uh, plan maintenance so it's like a machine will not work the best if you have it so switch on and running all the time yes so mm. if your production you know trying to not to stop it's not the best way you know it's like we don't leave a laptop on for the week so why do we leave our brains on so it's like you need to have this plan maintenance to switch off you need a, a power nap you know for the body and the brain in a sense <laughs> because when you relax you produce you know better you think clearer i don't know about any other people i had my biggest inspirations about my phd when i was having showers it's like this moments that you do something totally different and you've got eureka moments you know like archimedes so you need this kind of now i'm doing something for me uh, because it does make sense I said apart from the science and the engineering behind it you know it makes sense so if we are burn out you know, if we are on ourselves to the ground we only have ourselves to blame and i mean i don't know how did you what he said the other thing too is that um when you take the break and you come back you always you are able to give your best um when you are rested as supposed to because when you are tired there's no way you can give your very best in a tired state you can only give your best when you've been able to have that rest and take that break up so this brings us to our very last question um of the scene have you and my question to you is what activity what are you involved in that most people would be quite surprised to one find an engineer involved in and then also someone in academia involved in what is that surprising thing that you do oh sophia this one made me think and you know scratch my head and um, it's really hard to you know to find so not i i will explain some of my project and then you tell me for me everything may sense you know for me it's like anything that um, it's about dealing with the, you know the sustainable development goals or dealing about any of the challenges it has to have an engineering but not only an engineer so i have worked with artists in some of my projects you know especially for stem engagement uh, i have worked with computer experts i have worked with public policy officials because I can say, you know, a lot of things and you can convince the people, but if it's not the policy, the regulations to change, to make something happen, it will never go anywhere. So, the, my last, some of my projects, I think you mentioned them, um, I've done work with um, craft women um, in certain African countries and refugee women. And as I said at the beginning, you know, to, to go in a circular economy because that's part of my research as well it it makes sense because and it's always uh, women in many of the global south countries they make their living by producing craft products yes they can be handbags jewelry uh, rugs uh, ceramic things so they make things with their hands and they make them because their grandmothers make them because their daughters will do it it's like a generation thing and it's something between a hobby and a living because it works around the lifestyle yep. so for me i took this and i said that's that's operations and management that's manufacturing right. so i work with some amazing people from the from uganda and kenya um, and hopefully in Nigeria as well and we went to this uh, craft women group and I have to emphasize we weren't there to say that's how we do it we were there for them to tell us what they were doing mm -hmm. and then for us to ask do you know how how long does it take you to make this paper necklace or you know this bag you know have you costed your time 
Have you thought, you know, how much it costs you on money, how much it costs you on time, you know? Have you thought about them differently? So we apply Lean Six Sigma and terms like value stream mapping and, you know, a continuous improvement, you know, and they did it and they were fantastic. And it's like making them think it's not just about what you're making, it's also how you launch it. Because the I've got some uh, toys and necklaces behind me. Um, it's like the things that I got from there, it was like I know this, you know, um, little animal thing that was on there. Uh, I'll show, I'll bring it later. This little animal that made out from this card flip flops, it's from Joyce. And nobody else has the same, you know, rhinoceros or bird with me. Mm-hmm. This paper, it's from Grace, you know, in a village in Uganda. And there are different lengths and different things, but nobody has the same. It was about trying to make them uh, work in a way that it's a little bit more structured and make their life easier and think not just about making, it's about, you know, the digital skills to, to produce it. And it's like it's putting, they have the skills and they do not even appreciate them. I can take the instructions and I will never be able to cut paper in little triangles and fold it around a pin and make like 20 of them and make a necklace. It's mm-hmm. it's amazing. It's art and science. Yeah. I work with this with women and we visited women in slums and it, it pains me to see the skills, the passion, because they tell you we'll work 24-7, you know, if we have the customers and feeling this unfairness that you should have the customers, but you know, they don't have the digital skills or the support to bring this out there. But we work with refugee women in refugee camps, you know, to make them work as a kind of cop or like join the dots of what they're doing. That is a lovely uh, answer. I think it also brings to light that engineers don't work with just engineers, but we work with everybody in the community. Um, and in sometimes some of the work that we do brings enlightens us on some of the some of these much smaller economies that we really sometimes don't even pay attention to, and to have the skill set to one, even interact, collaborate, understand the, the, um, the type of work these these women are doing. Um, it's not something that would would occur to you openly in an engineering class, but that is the work that engineers out there are doing, which is amazing. Um, so to end this conversation, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you very much for one, sharing your engineering story, your career in, in engineering, as well as how that plays in academia. And we are very grateful. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sophia, for the time. Um, I said, it's this kind of programs that, you know, when you ask about support, you know, get, you know younger generations, need. it's the fact that you are not alone, you know, um, and that, actually brings me to another of my uh, projects that whatever um, I faced at my age is like what young engineers perhaps face uh, now, either they're like in the UK or Malawi or Indonesia. We face the same challenges and you know, it's we're supporting each other because that's what I think I should I made it mention. It's like the mentoring, uh, you know, within academia or within women and engineer. It's like knowing that when you feel like somebody's, um, you know, it's been mansplaining you or, you know, do not appreciate your uh, skills, it hasn't happened just uh, to you. Mm-hmm. So it's finding support from each other. And as I said, do not give up. Um, you know, it's like we all have like a fire inside us, you know, and you can either, you know, let it out and do wonderful things or, you know, it will eat us up uh, otherwise. So thank you so much, Sophia. I'm looking forward to the next of the, you know, the series. It's amazing what you do. So you 
As I was telling Sophia earlier, and do not edit this one out, she should interview herself or find somebody else to interview herself because what are you doing is inspiring. <laughs> oh, I'll definitely, I'll, 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 I'll definitely do that. I think I